as character gives. There is a large arterial grid. Uh, the grid, as you can see, has been pulled apart in an interesting way to make room for the river. So we've stretched it to the south, to the ship channel. We've pulled Commissioner Street, which you know, currently runs right through, and joined it into Villiers Street to actually give the river a space here. These are the private land ownerships, and these are very important. We, not all of this land is owned by Life from Toronto. Uh, much of it is in private hands. And then there's a, this is a, another analytical drawing that we did. There's this really interesting thing about how grids shift as they move around a natural feature. And as Bruce showed in his images, a rather man's idealized plan which didn't take into account the Don River or the Humber River through the survey done by Simcoe and then the subsequent laying out of blocks, there were all kinds of contortions that the city took as it actually bent around the Don River. So this ability to bend and adjust actually came into our block pattern, unlike, say, a Manhattan or a Western Canadian city where you have a, a, an absolutely regular orthogonal grid um, there are hardly two blocks in this plan that are identical. There are all kinds of little twists and turns and adjustments uh, which create great design opportunities in relation to the natural and man-made features. Um, there's a whole exercise of bridges. We're crossing a canal, we're crossing a river. We have wonderful bridge designers actually based in Paris, uh, RFS, who have contributed a whole vocabulary of families of bridges to deal with these different conditions bridges for pedestrians and cyclists, or transit, or road connections. And then starting to build up the layers. And what I'm doing here is kind of simulating the, these iterations that we went through as the elements combined. Now you start to see the river and its dynamic form, the landscape and its dynamic form, and then this tracing out of streets and blocks pattern, which relates to that, with a whole hierarchy of different street types embedded in that. Now this, now moving into three dimensions, this was that early three-dimensional image uh, that Bruce showed. And one of the key things about this neighborhood, or set of neighborhoods, is they don't exist in isolation. They are absolutely, Bruce was talking about the extension of the city, well, to take that down to this level, these are literally, these areas are the extension of the distillery of the St. Lawrence neighborhood of the new West End lands of East Bayfront neighborhoods of Corktown, uh, Regent Park making its way to the water on the other side of the river, South Riverdale, Mesleyville, uh, an extension from the east of Floorport, a uh, connection to the Toronto Highlands, to the Ontario Park. So sort of experiencing and pulling in all these lines of forces from all directions, not only in terms of the physical plan, but in terms of use. And what we have set ourselves is the, the goal that everyone around the world is chasing, and where cities are reinventing themselves on their waterfronts, uh, which are these sustainable 21st century neighborhoods. Um, what does that mean? It means that they can evolve organically. They're not sort of forced into a rigid image, which is then just implemented in mechanical phases. They have the flexibility over the decades in which they're created to respond to new market forces, to new ideas, to new design opportunities. They have a big range of scales of building and different types of buildings. They actually reflect the population mix of the city that they're in. Toronto's demography has a particular characteristic we want to uh, reflect that. Achieving a balance between people living and working is extremely important. Getting all of the supporting facilities to make real neighborhoods and add densities which can really make good use of the tremendous investment in public transit. Uh, from a land use standpoint, <coughs> surrounding us is a whole range of residential, recreational, cultural, industrial uses. And what we want to do in microcosm within this 350 acre area is to actually replicate all of those uses but in closer relationships, not in the big discrete lots, 
that they are in a separated form, but actually bring them closer together and exploit the synergies. Um, we've, the cornerstone of all of this hinges on getting the right relationship between public transit or non-private automobile ways of moving around, walking, and cycling. Obviously, part of that where people live and where people work. And there's nothing you can do from a sustainability standpoint. No amount of green building can overcome not having this relationship working well. This, this is the cornerstone of the whole thing. So we've set ourselves a population target. We've set ourselves a job target. This is based on city averages that are achievable in the areas of Toronto around downtown that are, are really working well. We look very carefully at the King's King Parliament um, and King's Spadina. And so this gives us some broad targets uh, that we are aiming at. Our land use plan, unlike the discrete patches of land use that we used to draw with colors, actually is this kind of pointiest version where ideally these land uses are juxtaposed at a very fine grain and every area is mixed. The only thing that will vary is the extent and quality of the mix from place to place as opportunities arise. But we've set ratios for living and working that need to be achieved and will be expressed in the regulatory framework. Uh, a cornerstone here is affordable housing. If we're going to deal with the entire population, and this is an image from Regent Park, uh, from the buildings that are currently going up uh, in the master plan that I've been working on it. Dundas in Parliament, we have to get that mix of market housing and various forms of affordable housing. Uh, this is a moving target as the government advances and retreats on programs as we find other ways of doing this with internal cost subsidy. It's a very touchy issue already arising in East Bayfront, but it has to be dealt with for this to be successful. Uh, in terms of work, uh, we also, similarly, it's not just about doing office buildings. Work occurs in many different forms. We want the plan to deal with everything from small-scale live-work situations to medium-scale buildings to larger buildings. Uh, the building typology has to take into account that range of opportunities. And very importantly, it's the relationship between the work environment and the public realm, which will really make these attractive to potential employers, make these sites attractive. Same kind of thing from applies to retail. Everything from large format retail in an urban form to corner stores in neighborhoods to very special things like TNT, which is already in the area uh, and is a key asset and we would love to actually retain in the plan in the same spirit that we're building on the physical artifacts. Transit orientation is extremely important for light rail stops. There are two lines uh, that are crossing here, uh, extending down toward Cherry Beach and out of Commissioner Street onto the ski and uh, Parliament, um, uh, Cherry Street rather. Um, these have frequent stops. We are working really carefully to make sure that the walking distances are, are excellent, which they are but also that the stops are generators of the form in the environments in which they sit. This, this is just a recall of, of the distribution of those artifacts within the plan, uh, which become key, key pieces. And this is a view looking east on Villiers Street, showing the S-Rock silos, which many of you may know has that incredible archway opening with the trucks pass under to uh, load cement. Uh, this will become a gateway to a uh, promontory park on the harbor. Uh, the scale of buildings we would like to see uh, vary, but it's not just about varying the scale, it's really varying the, the diversity of offerings for living arrangements. Different tenure forms, housing for families, older people, younger people, single people. Um, a whole range of options based on choice and based on need. And having great variety in the building technology actually facilitates that. Uh, we've made solar access, sunlight on public spaces, a really important feature working with Harvard and Harris, one of our consultants out of New York. We've developed this diagram which shows hours of sunlight on key public spaces, seven hours on major spaces, five hours 
on the important streets. And we're doing